Chapter 4, The Judenrat In July 1939, the Nazi regime had transformed the central organization of Jews in Germany, Reichstavertung der Juden in Deutschland, into, a, into an institution of its own creation, the Reich Union of German Jews. Reichsverengung der Deutschen Juden it was now responsible for the representing for representing German Jews, but rather for carrying out it was now responsible not for representing German Jews, but rather for carrying out the policies of the security police, the policy of creating Jewish organizations to serve German purposes was almost immediately imposed in conquered Poland as well, by virtue of the order of Heinrich Himmler's deputy, Reinhard Heydrich, on September 21st, 1939. On September 21st, 1939. Accordingly, councils composed of Jewish elders were to be established in each community. They were to be fully responsible, in the literal sense of the word, for the execution of German orders. The policy was reaffirmed in November 28th, 1939, decree issued by the new head of the central, of the general government, Hans Frank. The imposition of the Jewish council, or Judenrat, was a policy that the German occupiers in Poland uniformly supported for several reasons. The councils relieved the Germans of much of the burden of managing the Jewish communities, and thus spared them manpower. And they served as lightning rods, attracting much of the hostility and resentment of the downtrodden Jews. As the German manager of the Warsaw Ghetto, Hans Arswald cynically wrote, when deficiencies, when defi when deficiencies occur, oh, when deficiencies occur, the Jews direct the resentment against the Jewish administration and not against the German supervisors. The Jewish councils, at least in the first generation of membership, were usually composed of traditional community leaders, though often they were those who had held only second echelon positions before the war, as the most prominent leaders often had successfully fled. These first-generation leaders conceived of their task as a dual one, not only to fulfill German demands in order to protect their communities from worse repercussions, but also to devise strategies of mitigation and survival. Operating from a position of powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis the German occupiers, they often faced what were, in scholar Lawrence Langer's memorable phrase, choiceless choices. In some cases, individuals emerged from the councils as both dominant over the Jews and compliant toward the Germans. The most notorious examples of those who zealously adopted the Nazi principle of one-man authoritarian rule were Moshe Marin of Upper East, of East Upper Silesia, and Kaim Romkowski of Lodz. In many Jewish communities, such as Wiersbenik, from which some of the most prominent pre-war leaders had not fled, had not fled, the leadership remained more collective and also struggled with a mixed record of success to protect the community while placating the Germans. Immediately after the, the burning of the synagogue, Rabbi Rabinowitz, as the traditional religious leader of the community, was approached by the Germans to provide a list of candidates for the purpose of assembling the Judenrat. Service on the council was not an attractive prospect. One lawyer who was approached refused. Others begged the rabbi not to put their names on the list, but then relented. Eventually, the Judenrat was formed. It was supposed to have 24 members, but one surviving list of September 1940 distinguished between 19 
mem members and five co-workers or staff. By occupation, there were five self-employed businessmen, one doctor, one dentist, two bookkeepers, four office workers, four artisans, and seven tradesmen. The oldest, the pre-war community leader, Smul Iser, was 59. The youngest, the council secretary from Lodz, Mosh Adler, was 33. The Judenrat was also empowered to create a Jewish police force, the Order Service of Ordnungsdienst, Ordnungsdienst, yeah, which was formed before the end of 1939 under the Commandant Kornblum. Among themselves, the members chose Sinka Minkberg as president. He was a highly educated, cultured cosmopolitan businessman and banker. As a longtime activist and political leader of the community who defended Jewish interests vis-a-vis -vis the Polish authorities in the interwar period, his election to this post must have been self-evident. Among those who served with him on the Judenrat, three names in particular were frequently recalled by survivors, perhaps because they were the only three on the council who had subsequently held significant positions of influence on the camp council or lagerat of the Starakwitz labor camps. They were the leather goods dealer, Shlomo Einsman, the draper Rashmiel Wolf Owitz, and Mosh Beersenwig. Moshe Adler from Lodz served as the council secretary. Mosh Beerswig was vice president. Rashmiel Wolfwitz was the council's liaison to the German police. From the outset, the Judenrat faced two major tasks. One, the collection of money and other valuables was imposed to meet German demands. Two, providing workers to meet German labor demands was undertaken at the council's own initiative. Concerning the first task, the German occupation authorities periodically demanded that the Judenrat collect sizable financial payments or make specific deliveries of gold, jewelry, furniture, fur coats, and other valuable items from the Jewish community. The unenviable task of the Judenrat was to appropriate, was to apportion the obligation among the Jewish community by estimating each family's financial capacity to pay. Failure to make the required payments had drastic consequences at all levels. When Chana Glatt's father, owner of a textile business in the pre-war period, received an assessment that he felt was based on a significant overestimate of his wealth and that he could not pay he was arrested by the Jewish police and held in the city jail in Wiersbenik until his wife collected the required amount and turned it over to the Judenrat. Upon his release, he went into hiding with a peasant family in the countryside. When the next assessment was made and her mother did not pay, Chana herself was arrested and taken to jail. She was released three weeks later, only after her mother once more made the required payment. When the Judenrat failed to meet a number of petty demands from the German mayor, he wrote to the country administration, or Kreischoptemann, in nearby Ilyza, demanding punishment. In a rare surviving German document of November 16, 1940, the mayor accused the Judenrat of numerous transgressions, it had failed to make more than a perfunctory effort to demolish the ruins of a synagogue, which had burned down through the events of war. It had not paid various debts it had ac accumulated, and it had failed in its responsibility to take care of the needy, as the homeless and mentally retarded roamed the streets barefoot and in rags. He requested an exemplary punishment of the Judenrat, and specifically of the chief of of the chief culprits of this Jewish gang, 
Minkberg, Beersenwig, and Adler. The Kreischoptmann imposed a fine of 1,000 zloty. More serious were the repercussions from failing to make a payment demanded by the police chief, Walter Becker. So-called SS men, understandably, on such occasions, survivors can seldom identify German personnel or units with precision. Arrived, stormed into buildings of the Judenrat, and beat everyone in sight with their rifle butts. Many were badly injured, and at least one member of the Judenrat could not return to work for six weeks. Even more paralyzing to the community were the intensifying seizures of Jews for humiliating menial labor. Jewish males increasingly feared to walk the streets because of this threat. So they beseeched Minkberg to find a solution. He first approached the Polish mayor, Sokol, and begged for help. Though Sokol was the one Polish office holder in Staraszwica, noted for his benevolent attitude toward the Jews, he proclaimed himself powerless in this matter. With trepidation, Minkberg then approached the German commandant and with bitter heart explained to him the difficult situation the Jewish population was in because of the kidnapping for forced labor. He agreed that the Germans would no longer grab Jews for work. If the Jews provided a quota of Jewish workers as requested by the Germans each day. As a result, a Jewish labor division was established within the German labor office, Arbeitsmann. Isaac Locks, Vienna educated, fluent in German, and desirous of a control atmosphere, was appointed as its head. He thus worked both for the Judenrat as well as for the head of the Arbetsmann. An ethnic, an ethnic German named Niemzik. Yeah, as well as the head of the Arbeitsamt, an ethnic German named Niemzik. He was assisted by his eldest daughter, Chanka. The Judenrat was required to provide an exact count of male Jews in Wiersbnik between the ages of 12 and 60, divided by profession and capability. As of January 3rd, 1940, before the first major influx of Jews from the outside, the Jewish community had 828 male Jews capable of work, divided into 462 unskilled workers, 357 artisans and craftsmen, seven white-collar professionals, and two agricultural laborers. Laborers. It was Lask, it was Locke's task to register all local Jews, as well as newcomers, capable of work. Each one was, oblig each one was obligated to perform forced labor once a week, but the people who had means also paid the poor people who were willing to go to work in their place. There were more often more men lined up each morning to serve as substitutes than were needed, as this was the only means of livelihood for many. The system had two clear benefits. Removing the fear of random seizure and providing income for poor workers for otherwise uncompensated forced labor. But it did have a predictable social consequence. Soon, there were two groups, those who were always sent out to work on the one hand, whilst the other group compromised those who paid ransom money. If some found this to be a mutually beneficial arrangement, at least one survivor who identified himself as having been among the poor did not. This is a tragic moment in Jewish life because it pitted one Jew against another. If you had money and you could bribe a Jewish official, if you had sons, they didn't go. In contrast, he worked at hard manual labor, breaking stones and pushing wheelbarrows. In post-war memory, 
the survivors' assessment of the Weersbneck Judenrat is mixed, though more are inclined toward a favorable rather than an unfavorable evaluation. On the negative side, the daughter of Smul Iser, the more traditional pre-war leader of the Jewish community, felt that the younger men who had followed her father were not nice people. Another critique felt that in addition to pre-war community leaders, people who were simple, simply opportunists took advantage of their positions and corruption set in immediately. The most strident critic of the Judenrat claimed that they were hated by everyone because they got rich from the Jews, keeping for themselves some of what was collected for the Germans. An honest Jew would not go to the Judenrat, she claimed. Others were more sympathetic. In the view of one survivor, the Germans knew what they were doing when they forced the Judenrat to collect money and put people to work. And thus she did not blame its members. On the contrary, they anticipated the need to organize work and took from the wealthy to pay the poor. The Judenrat was composed of decent people who did their best not to hurt others while trying to meet the constant demands and outright blackmail of the Germans, opined another survivor. Minkberg in particular was viewed as a very intelligent and a very fine man and not bad. In contrast, the Jewish police of the order service were remembered less favorably. One survivor viewed them as more eager than they had to be in collaborating with the Germans. Others noted cryptically, some good, mostly bad, or not too good. In nearby Bodzentein, the Judenrat was even more clearly perceived by the Jews as a protector of the community vis-a-vis -vis the Germans, and the price paid by its leaders for failure to comply was more than a beating. When the elderly community leader was seen as unable to deal with the Germans, the town elders deemed it wise to select in his place a younger man who would be better suited to cope with the expected difficult demands of the cruel occupation government. They turned 28-year-old Froyam Sacher, who had voluntarily returned from the Soviet zone in the spring of 1940. Initially, he sought to mitigate German demands for valuables by maintaining a surface cordiality with the German authorities. To lessen the horror of labor roundups, the Bodzentine Judenrat also tried increasingly to develop local workplaces so that the people wouldn't be sent away. When the Germans demanded information on the whereabouts of a list of suspected black marketers, Sacher instead warned one of the suspects who made good his escape. Sacher was arrested and taken to the Gestapo in Kiels for questioning. Various attempts to pay ransom for his release failed. He was eventually transferred to Auschwitz, where he perished. <laughs> 